I think, I think the weather held some back this morning, but we are here. We're excited uh, about our lesson this morning and pray that God will bless us as we continue to talk about in this lesson, the Lamb of God. We're in, still in the first chapter. I always, uh, I don't know when we'll get out. It's 50 verses in the first chapter, so hopefully we'll get out soon. Um, We'll move quickly today because there's a few things that we don't need to um, focus on and we'll try to get to chapter 2 a little bit today. But um, before we begin, I just wanted to make some quick announcements. Um, we continue to study the book of Genesis on, on Wednesday nights, the book of Genesis on Wednesday nights. We are now beginning the life of Isaac. Um, that's a very brief a uh, few chapters, and then we will begin to talk about Jacob and Esau, which gets a little bit more entangled there. But um, you're welcome to come on Wednesday nights at 6.30, right here in this room. So I would love for you to, to make it part of your week to be here on a Wednesday night uh, to get a, just a little boost for the week. But we're excited that we're here this morning. Also wanted to make mention, it's good to see Miss Betty here. We continue to pray for her uh, and pray that God will continue to strengthen her. Uh, we want to lift up Karina to you guys. Keep praying for her. Um, her PET scan came back and they found uh, what appears to be some tumors in her lymph nodes on both sides and there was something on her rib cage that causes a little bit of concern. So she goes in for an MRI tomorrow and then, tomorrow or Friday? Tomorrow. tomorrow. And then Friday she goes back and, and starts some, start some treatment. Uh, not chemo, but a treatment to, uh, to begin to, to deal with those. So keep her in your prayers um, that God will straighten her. I'm sure this is her attacking her mind uh, as that's the first thing that gets attacked. Um, Speaking from experience, I know that these type of things just begin to attack the mind and why me and what and why and, you know, all the questions that um, that we as humans just ask, you know, and it's those are good questions. There's no question about it. So keep her in your prayers um, as we continue. So if you would be so kind as to join me as we pray and open up our time together and pray for our study this morning in John chapter 1 beginning in verse 29 is where we're going to begin this morning. Father we come before you this morning grateful for this opportunity you give us to study your word to worship you through the study of your word. We just pray this morning that all that is taking place on this campus be saturated by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this morning that every teacher, group leader, facilitator would be led by you this morning so that every person who walks on this campus will walk out later today knowing they have met with you. And Father, we just pray as we open your word that you would speak to us. I pray that you would hide me behind your spirit so that your words can be both spoken and clearly heard this morning as we need to hear what you have for us this morning. Father, we lift up to you, um, Karina, this morning, and we just pray that you would give her comfort and peace during this time as you are a wonderful source of both comfort and peace. We just pray that you would be with her, be with the physicians as they walk through and um, transgress these difficult challenges that they find. But we pray that we will be able to celebrate with her on the other side of this uh, opportunity to see your grace move in a special way. Father, we lift up Miss Betty to you. As it's great to see her this morning. We just pray that you would continue to give her strength 
and to handle all of these treatments that she's getting on a weekly basis. Father, strengthen her body as only you can. And it's so wonderful, a walking testimony to see her here this morning. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. And again, we ask you to speak to us through the power of your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 I usually carry this notebook with me that gives me a lot of information that I write down. Good morning, good morning. That I, I write down throughout uh, the time I'm preparing. And last week I got here and didn't have my notebook with me. So it was quite interesting to try to teach last week's lesson um, without my notes. I, w I was uh, flying a little blind, but uh, we're back and I've got my notebook with me. And it gives me um, some comfort and solace to know that I've got my notes and I can know what direction to go in. Um, but we're in the first chapter of the Gospel according to John. Beginning in verse 29, I'm going to read just a few verses through 34, but we're hopefully going to get a little further as the, the balance of this chapter is the call of John and Andrew and Peter, and then the call of Philip and Nathaniel. So five of his disciples, we see their call um, at the end of this chapter. And hopefully we get a little bit into chapter 2 today. But um, let's begin in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said. After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Remember, I am reading from the New King James Version. And we begin to see the wonderful um, launching of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And he wants to begin his ministry at the age of 30 years old. He wants to launch his ministry, and before it begins, um, though this gospel presentation does not speak of it, we know that after his baptism, he goes off by himself for 40 days uh, of fasting in the wilderness uh, and in the mountain area, and is, um, has a battle with the enemy directly and then he comes down off that mountain and begins to um, find his followers. So there is a break here. Uh, John knows from the other gospel presentations that that was spoke, spoken about quite a bit. And like I've said to you, John is really just trying to kind of give us some highlights and always remind us of who Jesus really was. So as John was baptizing, and we talked about last week, um, he was fulfilling his call to be a trailblazer, to be a, uh, a field plower, if you will, for Jesus. It says in verse 29 that the next day as Jesus was uh, coming toward him, John the Baptist sees Jesus. He knows him um, from a human perspective. Um, the Bible teaches us that they were second cousins and they probably, knowing uh, Mary and Elizabeth's very close relationship, they probably spent their childhood together, growing up together. They were six months apart um, from their birth, six months between the birth of John the Baptist and then six months later the birth of Jesus. Um, and at this point, John had only known Jesus as his cousin and 
I am often intrigued by this passage of Scripture because now John is introducing us to who Jesus really is. There is no indication that before this time he knew that the person he was preparing the way for was actually Jesus, his cousin. That there's no indication that he knows this, but it is revealed to him here. And that's the reason you see on two occasions, he says, This is whom I said, he comes after me, but is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, he says. I did not know him. And then in verse 33, he says again, I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. But I believe this is clear to us that John did not know who he was preparing the way for, and this becomes a revelation for him. And it begins with this verse 29, as John is doing what he is called to do, which is baptizing in the Jordan River. Below, this is at the base um, where Jerusalem lies, so it is a low valley, and everyone who gets there comes from the other territories and always has to travel down to Jerusalem, always down to Jerusalem. This was below sea level, and most people, without question, would travel down towards Jerusalem. So here, John is baptizing, and he sees Jesus, and he feels in his spirit, he, he clearly gets revelation of in, in his spirit, and says the following, what we would call revolutionary statement. And he says, the next day John saw, I'm verse 29 of chapter 1, in the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, again, why is this so revolutionary? First of all, he feels in his spirit that this is the one. And obviously it's confirmed in a moment we'll see that. But this revolutionary statement is very powerful. Because in the Old Testament, the way it worked was super simple. The way it worked was God established a sacrificial system. Without the shedding of blood, he said, there is no forgiveness or remission of sins. So that was the standard that God provided. That was the standard that God laid out from the beginning when the law was established. He established a sacrificial system even before the law. If you remember, Adam and Eve, we studied this a couple of months ago in our study in the book of Genesis. When God asked them and he comes to them and he says, why are you hiding? What's going on? And they say, well, we, we realize we're naked and we're hiding from you and and, you know, the conversation takes place. And God sacrificed an animal to create for them clothing so that they can cover themselves up. And that is the beginning of the sacrificial system. In order to have a relationship with God, there must be the shedding of blood. There must be a sacrifice. Someone must die to pay for the sins of mankind. And it was established back in the early day, that the best sort of sacrifice was that of a lamb. A lamb that was chosen from its birth, from its infancy, to have no spots or blemishes, to be perfectly white and prepared for uh, giving its life. And they would, um, they would offer the, the life of the lamb and they would they would literally lay their hand, they would lay their hand on the head of the lamb and say a prayer to God, in, in essence, transferring the sin of humanity onto this lamb. And then they would kill the lamb, take its blood, and sprinkle its blood onto what was known as the mercy seat. The mercy seat, which this is not working. If you've ever seen. You know, you've seen me do this plenty of times. Here's the tabernacle. Here is the holy place. And then within the holy place, 
there was the Holy of Holies. And to enter here, there was a curtain that was about 400 pounds. It was about seven inches thick um, and would only be entered into once a year. And inside the holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant contained three important items. The second copy of the Ten Commandments, uh, a bowl of the manna that God provided to them in the desert, and a piece of the rod or staff that Aaron used. If you remember, it was that staff that became turned into a stake in front of the Egyptian pharaoh. Um, well, this were the three things within. And on top, they created this as God mandated with gold covering and two cherubim to face each other. And this is where God would show up. The Shekinah glory of God would show up and appear here. And this is where they believed the presence of God was. And as they prepared this, this tabernacle, they would lay out all of God's people all around it. And they would camp where God in his presence would be in the midst of them. So one day a year, the high priest would go in there one day, better known as Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, okay, Yom Kippur, the, the, the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies and then take the blood of the Lamb and sprinkle it on top of the mercy seat. And he would be praying for atonement for the people's sins. And as God would look down, and instead of judging them for their shortcomings, he would see the blood and forgive them of their sins. But the, the, the blood of the lamb would only cover the sins of mankind. And they would have to do this on a continual basis. Every year on Yom Kippur, they would have to pray that God would cover their sins. And it would be a continual requirement. Now please understand, this is the way God mandated it. This is the way God set it up. But now we see the revolutionary statement of John where he says, Behold the Lamb of God who, who does what? He takes away the sin of the world. He takes away our sin. He doesn't cover it up with his blood. He takes it away. So it's, it's this statement that John makes that really launches the ministry of Jesus and explains that he is the Lamb of God that is going to take away the sins of the world. It no longer covers us. It no longer covers our sin. It takes it away. Never to be thrown in our face again. We're never to be reminded of it again. God takes it and throws it as far as the east is from the west. He throws it and we're never to be reminded of it again. When God, when we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, it is that He takes away our sins. Doesn't cover them. He takes them away. That's the difference between the Old Covenant, Old Testament, and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they were under the law. In the New Testament, we're under grace. We're under grace. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Grace is that transaction that takes place at the cross between man and God, and we are, our sins are lifted, sins are taken away, removed forevermore, erased, however you want to call it. They're gone. And not to be reminded. Does that mean, you know, do we continue to sin? Unfortunately, we're still in this flesh. Yes, we continue to sin. And as long as you ask for forgiveness of those sins too, they are also um, washed away. So this statement that John makes is one that you should take a hold of and always remember. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, who takes away the sin of the world. And then he says in verse 30, This is he... Of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And again, John is speaking uh, spiritually here. John was older than Jesus, even though by six months he was older. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. 
And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I think we talked a little bit about this last week, but we talked about it from John's perspective. I want to talk about it from Jesus' perspective now. John's perspective is one of curiosity to me, but I always bring it up because a lot of times, you know, we as humans, we get uh, a bad diagnosis in our family like Sal and Karina are dealing with or Miss Betty or my wife, all of these bad things. And sometimes there are people, and I'm not saying these have it, but we all live through it. There are people who forget in the darkness what they learned in the light. And we talked a little bit about that last week, and I always want to bring this up because I challenge you to, even in the midst of dark, the darkest point in your life, to remember that God is still God. Amen. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And though you may be walking through something that is incredibly difficult, God is still God. He is still on His throne. And John the Baptist, who sees this, he, here he says, and again, I, I, I just feel led to say this again. He says, uh, and I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is the Son of God. And I have seen, he says in verse 34, and testified that this is the Son of God. Not even a year later, six months later, John's thrown into prison. He's threat being threatened with death. He would eventually die uh, in prison. Uh, he would be beheaded. Um, and it, it's awful, but he's facing this. And, 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 you know, he is even the one, he says... Um, I must decrease while Christ increases. So he understood what his ministry was all about. And in the darkness, two of his disciples come and see him and say, hey, how are you doing? You're doing okay? He says, hey, go ask Jesus if he's the one or should we look for another? Where he's the one that testified, hey, I saw the Spirit of God come upon him. And the, and, and the person who sent me said, hey, whoever you see the Spirit of God descend and stay upon, know that this is the one. He is the one that will baptize with the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God. He is the one. But yet in the darkness, in the pain, in the hurt, in the, in the, in, in the time of sickness and, and fear, and all of this comes, all of these human instincts come forward, out comes, are you the one or should we look for another? So, Anyway, I wanted to say that again because I think that is a powerful thought when we think about that. And uh, we've all been there. We've all been there. Um, it's just natural. And again, he says, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So let's move on. Verse 35. He says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus, as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and seeing them following him, he said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to be translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said, Come and see. And they came and saw and they was, he was where he was staying and remained with him. That day, now it was about the 10th hour, the 10th hour. So if you know, um, according to Jewish time, that would be about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, why is that important? It's really not, but it, it, if the sundown, according to them, is 6 p.m., so they, they were trying to find a place. So one of the two heard John speak and followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him. So one of the things you need to know about is John, in his gospel, doesn't mention his own name. Later on in, in the gospel, he'll talk about the one, the disciple that Jesus loved. Um, this is one of those examples that John doesn't mention. 
Um, most other gospels and most historians will tell you that the two disciples of John the Baptist that followed Jesus were John and Andrew. John and Andrew. Those are the two disciples. Andrew had a brother whose name was Peter. And we know um, that Peter and John and James become the, the integral uh, part of the inner circle of Jesus. So one of the two heard John speak and followed him it was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, the anointed one. That Christ, when you talk about the word Christ, anytime you see it, you know it simply means the anointed one. That was his mission to be the Messiah, the anointed one of God. Um, and he brought him to Jesus. Andrew brings Peter to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, or Cephas. So, um, there's a lot of questions here, because later on, they continue to call him Peter. But this was a futuristic anointing upon Peter. This was a, a um, without question, a prediction of what was going to happen. And, and here's the translation. Peter is, is considered to be the equivalent of a pebble, a small stone, the name Peter. And he says to him, you are Simon, small stone, son of Jonah, but you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Most would, would translate this a boulder, a large, immovable stone. Um, so he immediately calls on this and, and gives him, uh, without question, a, a prophecy of what Peter would become. Now, let me just stop here and quickly clear up one of the big mistakes in Scripture. One of the big mistakes in, in, in religion as we understand it. I am not going to say this to be offensive. I'm going to say this so that you understand that it's not biblical. Okay? What am I saying? Unfortunately, um, if you understand the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, they run where they have priests and bishops and archbishops and cardinals and then ultimately reporting to the Pope. That is the, the structure of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church believe that Peter was the first Pope. Peter was the first pope, and they, they operate with the thinking uh, on the scripture that says, upon this rock I will build my church. And they, they, they consider Peter to be the first pope. Why? Because Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they began to answer and said, oh, we've heard some say that you're, you know, um, you're Elijah, and you're John the Baptist coming back. And, but, but Jesus says, but who, hey guys, who do you say that I am? And Peter gets up and says, being very rambunctious that he is, being very outspoken, he ran, say, gets up and says, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And Peter says, that, and Jesus says, yeah, that is correct. And upon this rock, I will build my church. What Jesus was talking about was the statement that, that Peter made, that he, Jesus, was the Christ, son of the living God. And upon Christ shall the church be built, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail. You're with me? Mm -hmm. However, they take this passage of Scripture and combine it with that passage of Scripture, and it's like a little buffet, and they take a little bit of this and a little bit of this. Next thing you know, their plate is full, and they establish a 
religious belief that, oh, you see, Jesus changed his name from Pebble to Boulder, and then Jesus said later on, upon this rock I will build my church. They, that must mean Peter, so Peter is the Pope, and Peter is the leader of the church, and Peter is the foundation of the church, and we should build upon him. So, so you understand, that's how um, misguided things happen. And unfortunately, uh, the Catholic Church, one of the very powerful and dominant uh, religious systems in this world, believe this. Why? I, I just, I told you. And you could, you could kind of understand. And then listen, there's, there's some truth to the fact that upon what the disciples built, what the disciples did at the early church was where we built the church. Yes, they were the beginning foundation stones, but they're not the foundation. The foundation, and unless the church is built on Jesus Christ, it will crumble. It will not stand. So we must always understand that. So I wanted to, to say that just to, to remind you. So now, the following day, Jesus... Okay, I'm, good. I'm doing good on time. I want to get to chapter 2 because I want to have some fun with chapter 2. Uh, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, uh, a city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was considered a... a a ghetto. It was considered a slum town. It was considered uh, a place where people didn't want to live. And Jesus claimed to come from this area, Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, asked the question that everybody had on their mind: Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And by the way, that's the simple invitation that all of us should be using. That's it. You, you, you know, people start to question, oh, but I don't like church people. I don't like this. And what's going to happen? And all you we need to say is come and see. Come and see. Come and see. That's the invitation that, that we should never forget. We try to, we try to um, fancy it up. We try to make it more than it is. But the invitation, the gospel invitation is simply come and see. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, or teacher, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God descending, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Um, and and that, that happens... Uh, a great deal where they get to see the the greatness of who God was and it begins right here so everybody has everybody knows this story everybody's heard about this story i don't know that i'm going to share with you anything new from this story but i think it is one of the most impactful uh, truths that we see it is but without question the first miracle of Jesus. His ministry has begun. He has now um, acquired um, many of his disciples. It is not known how many, if they're all 12 were there at the time, but neither here nor there. John was there, and John records this miracle, and he um, finds it, and it says, on the third day. On the third day of what? On the third day in Galilee. Remember, he had switched and, and, and decided to now begin, his, begin ministering in Galilee. Um, on the third day, 
there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. I'm going to stop. Um, weddings were a very big deal. Um, if you ever want to study the weddings of the old culture, learn about the weddings of the Amish. Uh, they, they have taken the, the mantle of the early Jewish traditions and run with it. And weddings are very still, still in many ways arranged. And weddings can take as many as seven weeks um, as the couple would um, be betrothed and then they would travel from house to house in their city uh, one house sometimes two houses per day and they would share a meal with the family of that house and that that family would then bless them and gift them and and pray over them and speak over them and give them whatever marital advice that they felt was needed and they would literally travel for many many weeks uh, on this and then it would be culminated with one um, party with one celebration uh, we call it a reception uh, and they would invite everybody in the town and come and um, gather together and it was customary for there to be wine and um, many people will talk about, oh, yeah, you see, I, I can drink wine because Jesus turned water to wine. So we'll talk a little bit about that if we have some time. If not, we'll get it next week. But um, it would be incredibly embarrassing for the couple to launch their marriage and run out of wine. They would be the um, they would be on the tongues of everyone in that community for the horrible reception that they put together. Running out of wine or food, but more wine um, was incredibly um, devastating. It would cause um, a lot of cursing on that couple. Their marriage would literally be um, in jeopardy um, because the tongues would wag in the town. They would be, they would be, people wouldn't want to do business with them. People wouldn't want to uh, deal with them. People wouldn't want to worship with them. People wouldn't want to buy their product or sell them product because they had failed at the most important day of their lives. So I, I want you to understand that running out of wine was just not, hey, okay, we ran out of wine, just give them water, no big deal, okay? No, <laughs> it's a huge deal, huge. And it, it has ramifications for everyone. So it says, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So... Many would tell you um, there's no real indication, but it seems important that either one of the parties was related to Mary or she was in charge of the event. She was the event planner, which is what we call them today, right? I don't know. But somehow, she's at the wedding, and more importantly, Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. They didn't crash the wedding. They had been invited to the wedding. They were in town. They were told, hey, we're having a wedding. You know, maybe it's a relative of Jesus. It All indication is that there was a strong possibility that they were related to Mary, thus related to Jesus. You with me? And the damaging effect of not having enough wine caused some major concerns. So, we begin reading again. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. 
super important that you understand that. If it's in the Bible, there's a reason for it. It's not just a off-the-cuff remark. They Jesus wasn't just passing through and happened to crash this wedding. And, and you know, no, he was invited to the wedding, which means somehow he knew the bride and groom. Bride or groom. He knew one of them. So, and when they ran out of wine, verse 3, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. So, Jesus is sitting at table 8 with his disciples. And Mary comes over from where she was and says, hey, Jesus, um, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Now, I just want you to know that this is an Eastern culture. It's definitely not a Hispanic culture. If I would have ever addressed my mom that way, we, there'd be a whooping coming. Uh, uh, she would lose her mind. Even if I was an adult, she would say, who are you talking to that way? Right? And I know it's not only Hispanic culture, because I'm looking around. You know what I'm talking about. The, the, the mother comes to the son and says, hey, they have no wine. And he turns and said, woman, what, what, what's that have to do with me? Woman. Now, please understand that that was a, a title of, of respect. That was one of honor. So... I, I've learned to understand um, it, it's a way of saying um, lady um, again one of respect but anyway so verse 3 Jesus at table 8 is told by the mother hey I just, I just want you to know that you know they ran out of wine and and I, I'm sure the disciples are looking at each other. Now, he hadn't done anything. Well, some would say, yeah, he, he told Nathaniel what he was doing. Yeah, you know, he, he did those things, but he hadn't done a miracle or a sign. And by the way, this is considered a sign, and I'll, I'll tell you why if we have time. If not, we'll pick it up next week. The difference between a miracle and a sign we talked already about. Um. But she comes to him and says, hey, they got no wine. And he says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Which means they had discussed amongst themselves, you read between the lines, that there was going to be a launch, there was going to be an announcement, there was going to be a time where Jesus was going to be fully engaged in ministerial things and he was going to have to leave the house and begin for the next three and a half years his ministry his work what he has been called to do and he tells mary who knew because they had discussed this hey what does that have to do with me my hour has not yet come so his mother responds and I, and I find it quite interesting. Again, I'm one who likes to read between the lines because here is one um, here is one that you must recognize. So the disciples, John and Andrew and Peter and Nathaniel and maybe a couple of others are sitting around the table watching this interaction between mama and son. And he says, woman, you know, hey, I got nothing to do with this. My hour has not yet come. And they're looking at each other, and I'm sure Peter's going. <laughs> and Mary responds very, very interested. She doesn't argue. No, it says, His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now that is that is a passage of Scripture that makes absolutely no sense to anyone unless you know who Jesus is. It is one that you should make note of because Mary knew her son. Mary knew 
Mary had seen, Mary had experienced how Jesus, the man of the house, by the way, at this point, some say uh, Joseph died when John, when jo when Jesus, Joseph, his father, earthly father, died when Jesus was 15 or 16 years old. That's what historians tell you. So he became the man of the house, and there were times where there were problems that would arise. There was a plumbing issue, or there was something to be done, and Jesus would fix it. He would always fix it. Now, I'm making light of this, but there is a relationship between Mary and her son, between Mary and Jesus, that no one else could understand. Remember, when he was born, and all of these things were said about him, the Bible says when the shepherds show up, showed up at the manger and, 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 and worshipped him, and then when, when the kings, two years later, two years later the kings showed up at the house and they worshipped him, the Bible says Mary pondered all these things in her heart. She just put them in the safe. She just put them there and guarded them, but she knew who Jesus was. She knew. She was born of a virgin. He was born of a virgin. She knew who Jesus was. He, he leaped. He, 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 he would cause all these things to happen. And then when she shows up at Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth's child leaps in the womb. She knew who she had. She knew who Jesus was. So she immediately responds to her servants, to the servants that were there. She's in control of the party. And she turns to her servants. She said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Because if there's anything I know about my boy, is he's not going to let me down. If there's anything I know about this Jesus, he will never let me down. Mary knew who Jesus was and says, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were, like, again, she pointed them to Jesus. She said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Pay attention to him. Because I know he's going to do something. I know he's going to handle it. It may seem insignificant. And it wasn't. It was a big deal for, again, the bride and groom. But he's going to handle it. So, there were six Water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. These big, large water pots that were used to be in this facility so that the Jews could use the water in the pots as a, as a cleaning system. It was very important to someone who was visiting this location to be properly purified, and, and that purification took place, took effect in two simple ways. One, you washed your hands, and two, you washed your feet. Those were what was considered Jewish purification when entering a place uh, that was sacred to them, that was holy. So obviously, if you understood, the only large gathering rooms were in the temple were where the Jewish Jewish people would get together the um, so this was where they were and these pots were used for the purification so they were filled with water um, according to the ma manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece Jesus said to them fill the water pots with water and they fill them to the brim and he said to them Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made of made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out good wine. And when the guests are well drunk, then... The cheaper wine. You have kept the good wine until now. Now, okay, so he turns the water to wine. Okay, I want to dig a little deeper. 
Okay? I want to pay attention. What on God's green earth were these servants thinking? Mary says, do whatever he tells you to do. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. So he says, hey, you see those water pots? Fill them to the brim with water. Fill them with water. And then go take these pots to the head of the wedding, to the master of the feast, and serve it to him. Now, please understand that if you serve water to the master of ceremonies or to the head of the wedding, that would be considered insulting to the fact that you could be thrown in jail. How dare you serve water to the head table? Can't do it. So here are these servants who are told by Mary, who is signing their check. I don't know. But I'm just assuming that she's in charge of the ceremony and she's paying them to be day laborers. And they show up and they're, they're watching this this communication between mom and son. Whatever he says to you, do it. So he doesn't delay and says, fill the water pots with water. Okay, we'll do whatever. He told us to fill the water pots with water. That doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. But then he says, okay, take and draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. What? And they're looking at each other. No, you do that. No, you do that. I, I ain't doing that. I'm not serving them water. So someone is bold enough to get and pour water. I don't know what utensils they use, but someone's bold enough to pour the water and take it to the master of the feast. And when he tasted the water, that water was made wine. Not only was it made wine, but the master said, Hey, oh, most people give us the good stuff in the beginning so that we can get drunk and then give the cheap stuff later when nobody will notice. There's a lot to be said about drinking when you think about that passage of scripture. But he said, you have kept the best wine or good wine until now. Now, can you imagine for a second what these servants were thinking right there? Can you imagine for a second that these servants who were handing water to the master of ceremonies and are being celebrated for the best wine. It reminds me of the feeding of the 5,000. We, uh, we, we see that story and we, we think about the little boy with the fishes and the loaves. But if you understand that story, the miracle happened in the hands of the disciples. They kept breaking bread and it kept multiplying in their hands, in their possession. Jesus spoke it into existence and it happened in the hands of the disciples. Jesus spoke this into existence and it happened in, in the hands of the servants. And not only did Jesus change the water to wine, but he changed it the best to the best wine. And he served the best and saved the best for last. The world offers people the best. The world will try to lay out the red carpet and offer all the lights. And they dangle all these attractive items in front of humanity. And Christianity is the opposite. Because the truth of the matter is, 
The world offers all these things and there comes pain. Listen, when you make a deal with the devil, it may look good in the beginning, but it all, always turns into pain. There, there are a lot of people who, who you read about who have sold their soul. Mm -hmm. They have sold their soul to become rich or famous or popular. And over time, if you follow their story, they all end up the same way. Ruined. In turmoil. In pain. Five marriages. All of this stuff starts to happen and their life falls apart. Why? Because it all began with hoopla and lights and all the bells and whistles and all the great things. And that's how Satan operates. Just like this wine at this wedding ceremony. But Christianity is the opposite. It gets better and better with time. Christ keeps the best wine for last. And the feast follows the fast. By the way, wine in Scripture represents one very important thing. Joy. Joy. When you think about wine in Scripture, it's really reflecting or a symbol of joy. Now you say, okay, well, now you're talking. Because <laughs> I do get a little joyous when I have a few drinks. I do get a little slap happy when I have a few drinks. No, that's not what that means. Because you and I both know if you have a few drinks, what happens the next day? Shouldn't I, can I get some aspirin? I shouldn't have had so much to drink. Oh. That's not what Christianity does. Christianity brings you joy. And I'm here to tell you that Christ keeps the best for last. And there's an application here for the Jewish kingdom. I don't have much time, but I'll go through it quickly. Currently... There was no true joy in Judaism. Dreary rituals and ceremonies. Life was tasteless. They were strangers to divine joy. But the Lord wanted, to put, wanted them to put their faith in Him. And He will turn their drab existence into the fullness of joy. The water of Jewish rituals, ceremonies could be turned into the wine of joyful reality in Christ. That's why this is not just a miracle. It's a symbol or a sign of what Jesus was trying to accomplish. Jesus had done something incredible. This is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested His glory and His disciples believed in him. Can you imagine what the disciples were thinking? After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, his earthly brothers, remember James and Jude were his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. We have read and talked about the story of the turning the water to wine and I want you to know, Jesus is prepared to turn your water to wine. You've been living a life going through the routine. You've been going through everything. Everything seems to be ho-hum, humdrum. You don't know where it's going to end. You don't know what God has in store for you, but I'm here to tell you what God has in store for you will blow your socks off. He wants you to walk in the fullness of joy. He wants you to have a life that is filled with abundance. I have come, Jesus said, to give you life and life more abundantly. What's the abundance of the abundance life? Joy. He wants you to walk in joy. He wants you to walk in new wine. We, we, we're tired of operating in water. We're tired of operating in ritual and routine. I, I'm tired of coming to church just, just to come to church, just so that people can see me. It's time that we come to church to meet with God and taste the new wine. 
and taste the new wine. But where does it begin? It begins with Mary. And my advice to you this morning is to listen to her. Tell you whatever he tells you to do, do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the blessings of this opportunity you give us to study your word. And we pray that as we see this transition here between his calling of the disciples, between John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and between the time he turns the water to wine, may we recognize all of these truths and allow them to penetrate our heart to be better followers of Jesus. Father, we ask you this morning, we want that new wine. We, 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 we're going through the routine, we're struggling, we're having difficulties in our life, but Father, we want to taste the new wine, the joy that Jesus promised us. I have come to give you life and life in abundance. Father, we want that abundance. May we learn to walk in that abundance. And it's simple. We just have to follow Mary's advice. Whatever Jesus tells us, we are to do. It's called obedience. And Father, if we want to walk in that joy, and we want to walk in that peace, and we want to walk in that love, may we truly understand that all we have to do is listen to the words of Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning. We bless you. And we ask you to be with us as we walk into the worship service this morning. Bless us as only you can. And we ask you these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus the Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.